So now that we have an understanding of needs and requirements and of the process of requirements engineering, let's look a little more closely at the process of developing a good set of requirements. We saw earlier that needs and requirements can be captured in logical or functional hierarchies. At the end of this module, we'll look briefly at a tool called the Requirements Breakdown Structure, or the RBS, that will assist in developing these hierarchies. First, however, let's look at the process by which the needs and requirements are related to each other at the various levels of hierarchy. A functional hierarchy is produced through two principal processes, elicitation and elaboration. Elicited elements are able to be directly attributed to the source and are normally gathered by interview or workshop. An elicited element could also ever be drawn directly from other constraints, such as a regulation, for example. That means elicited elements are explicit, that is, they are largely given to us directly by the business or the stakeholders, or they're taken directly from some constraint. On the other hand, elaboration involves analysis, which would conclude that some element is necessary as a result of the business or stakeholder's intentions. This analysis is either decomposition or derivation. Decomposition involves breaking the high-level function into those low-level functions that are explicitly required by it. On the other hand, derivation entails requirements engineers to draw some inference. That is, business management or the stakeholders did not state the function directly, but the derived function is a necessary part of the system design if one or more of the directly stated functions are to be met. The elicitation and elaboration tasks are not for novices. That's particularly true for elaboration. To undertake them properly, requirements engineers, or business analysts, must understand the business, the application domain, the specific problem, the needs and constraints of the stakeholders. They need to understand acquisition and project management, requirements engineering, system engineering, the technologies, and the engineering involved. So you can see from this list that such skill sets rarely happen by accident and must be deliberately developed. By way of a simple example, Consider an upper-level statement of the mission of a medical centre. So we can say the ACME Medical Centre is to provide a selected range of medical services in a secure and comfortable environment in order to attain a nominated profit. And if that's the mission statement for the system, then requirements engineers could decompose and derive functions from that statement. The following functions are decomposed. That is, they are explicit in the statement and we highlight them here in red bold font. The decomposed functions are, well clearly we need to provide a selected range of medical services, we need to provide a secure environment, a comfortable environment and attain a certain level of profit. But that's not all we need to do. Requirements engineers would derive functions as necessary functions but not directly stated by the stakeholders to be able to provide the infrastructure, to be able to manage the centre and manage its services and of course to support the services. Needs and requirements can be identified in a number of different ways, and this slide lists quite a few. Probably the most useful are structured workshops. They're certainly the fastest and most efficient way. Workshops should start with strawman artefacts that are fine-tuned and augmented throughout the assigned period. Workshops should be facilitated to make sure that they run smoothly. Where the problem is more open, brainstorming and problem-solving sessions can be considered to be unstructured structured workshops, and are therefore really only useful early on in the process to assist with the development of initial artefacts, which we probably take on then to structured workshops. Interviews should be considered as one-on-one -on -one workshops, that is, they should be structured, start with some straw man artefacts and have an agenda if maximum value is to be attained. Surveys and questionnaires don't have a great return rate, somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 20% in any context, so they're not very good ways of ensuring that all stakeholder views are represented, but they are a good way of ensuring that the maximum number of people have at least had the opportunity to contribute. Probably another useful way, particularly at a lower level of understanding the way in which the system is going to work, are use cases or operational scenarios. We humans are natural storytellers, so it's a very useful way to ask stakeholders to describe the way in which they're going to interact with the system by asking them to tell them a story about it. Similarly, when we're at a sufficiently low level in the design, Simulations, models and prototypes are useful ways to understand needs and requirements as well as to conduct various trade studies and analyses. The remainder of the activities listed here are very low level and they're not really useful until we're well into preliminary design, in which case we might use things like observations of work studies, we might participate in work activities to get a feel for how they're conducted, we could make observations of the environment, we could do documentation reviews, market analysis, 
competitive system analysis, reverse engineering and benchmarking. The entire system engineering process aims to produce a system that's both verified against the documents that produce the system and validated against the original needs that initiated the development in the first place. So there are two principal acts. Verification, which ensures that the system at any stage matches the specifications we have developed for it, that is, we have built the system right. And then there's validation, which ensures that the system meets the original business needs and requirements, that is, have we built the right system? Now often, these two associated aims are combined into the generic term verification and validation, or V and V. Returning to our diagram showing how requirements engineering assists in the development of requirements, we can now work backwards. Before the customer accepts the system from the contractor, the delivered system is verified. And it's verified against the system specification. That is that we're checking that the contractor has to deliver a system that meets the thing we've contracted them to do, that is to meet the system spec. Before the system is put into service, however, and this is particularly true of capability systems, we must validate the system against the original needs and requirements. So we validate it against the stakeholder needs and requirements, and then the business needs and requirements, to ensure that both those level of needs and requirements are met. Verification and validation is underpinned by a well-managed approach to what we call T&E, test and evaluation, which aims to support the delivery of a system that is both verified and validated. So there are three major categories of T&E that are applied to coincide with the activities of the acquisition phase, the transition between the acquisition and utilisation phase, and the retirement phase. Developmental test and evaluation, DT&E, refers to the T&E activities undertaken during the acquisition phase to support the design and the development effort. DT&E activities may also occur during utilisation to support activities such as the development of modifications. Acceptance test and evaluation, or AT&E, represents the formal testing conducted to enable the customer to verify the system and therefore to be able to allow them to accept it from the developer. AT&E therefore effectively forms the boundary, or the transition, between the acquisition phase and the utilisation phase, and as such, it's a very important contributor to formal qualification review. The next activity is operational test and evaluation. Once the system has been accepted from the developer, ot &E may be conducted under realistic operational conditions by operational personnel in order to validate the capability system. ot &E is normally conducted for a period of time following acceptance of the system by the customer from the contractor, that is, after ATE and before full introduction into service.